Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Wow. Okay. <laughs> All right. Let's see how this is going to turn out. Uh, try again. Try, nah, I, that's it. You had your shot. That was it. That was the one opportunity. <laughs> You know, the, the truth is, is often as we think about coming to church from week to week, that there are, there are hopefully some weeks where you're just really excited, you're really thrilled that, that God has done so much in your life, you just are bubbling over. And then there are some weeks when you're like, it's all you can do to get up in the morning. And the truth is, is as we have that mix within us, uh, within us as a group, and maybe even a mix inside our own souls, God honors all of that. And so there is something really powerful and sacred, holy about the fact that we have come together to figure out what it means to love God, love one another, and live out our faith every day. So I am excited to be able to do that with you. I think God has some really good stuff in store for us. So why don't we just pray together, shall we? Gracious and heavenly Father, God, we give ourselves to you. We are excited to see what it is that you will do. Lord, help us at the end of this that we're not asking, well, was that good? But asking instead, did we do well? Did we honor you? Did we serve you? Did we worship you? Did we cry out your praises? Because we want to give this time, this place, this moment, our very selves to you. In Jesus' name, amen. As we lift up your name, as we lift up your name, let your fire fall, let your fire fall, send your wind and your rain, send your wind and the rain, on the wings of love, on your wings of love, pour out from heaven your passion and presence, bring down your burning desire, revival fire For Jesus, Father, let revival fire fall. As we lift up your name, as we lift up your name, let your kingdom come. Let your kingdom come. Have your way in this place. Have your way in this place. Let your will be done. Let your will be done. Pour out from heaven your passion and presence. Bring down your burning desire. Revival fire fall. Revival fire fall. Fall on us here in the power of your spirit. Father, let revival fire fall. Revival fire fall. Revival fire fall. Let the flame consume us with hearts ablaze for Jesus. Father, let revival fire fall. Revival fire fall. Revival fire fall. Fall on us here in the power of your spirit. Father, let revival fire fall. Revival fire fall. Revival fire fall. Let the flame consume us with hearts ablaze for Jesus. Father, let revival fire fall. I want within my heart, desire beyond my own, to be like Jesus. But then I see my life, the distance from your throne, and my heart longs for you. Holy Spirit, come, breathe to me with your fire. Make me 
This is a new song to us, but the words are just so ripe for where we are right now. So as we sing through this song, just pull those words in and let them be from your heart. Let them just resonate within your soul, all the promises that the Father God has provided for you through his son. There is a power, there is a presence holding all heaven watching the earth it can part troubled waters quench every thirst heal what is broken and break every curse there is a power so overwhelming all of creation bows to its name and it came to save every captive, cover every shame, every, every promise, and break every chain. Oh, there is power in this room, and every darkness has to move. For the light is breaking through And everything that exalts itself must fall Underneath the power of our great God There is a power death cannot alter There is a grave Hell could not steal. 
is here to change every outcome, lift every head, win every battle, and raise the dead. Oh, there is power in this room, and every darkness has to move. For the light is breaking through, and everything that exalts itself must fall underneath the power of our great God. In the name of Jesus there is power. In the name of Jesus there is healing. In the name of Jesus, there is power. In the name, in the name, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, there is power. In the name of Jesus, there is healing. In the name of Jesus, there is power. In the name. In the name, in the name of Jesus, in the name, in the name, in the name of Jesus, there is power in this room, and every darkness has to move, for the light is breaking through. And everything that exalts itself must fall underneath the power of our great God. Everything that exalts itself must fall underneath the power of our great God. So if there's something coming against you this morning, everything that exalts itself above what God's word says must fall, must fall. You're not here as an orphan. In John 14, 18, Jesus gave that promise, promise of the Holy Spirit being with you, guiding you, and living in you. There is a promise, folks, in the scars on his hands. There is power in his name. Do you know that 365 times, and I don't find that unusual, 365 times in the Bible it says, do not fear. One for every day around the sun. Do not fear. Isn't that lovely? Doesn't that just... What a promise. 365 days. Google it. Google it if you don't believe me. You know, in every crisis that we go through, God provides us an opportunity to put our lives in his hands, to stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, to trust in him. And that's not just static standing. That's prayer. That's praise. But our God is an awesome God, and he will deliver. He will deliver. He will deliver. He will deliver. Let's stand. I 
see the old has passed away, the new has come. Now I have resurrection power, living on the inside, Jesus. You have given us freedom, no longer bound by sin and darkness, living in the light of your goodness. You have given us freedom. I'm pressed in your royalty. Your Holy Spirit lives in me. I see the past has been redeemed. The new has come. Now I resurrection power living on the inside Jesus you have given us freedom no longer bound by sin and darkness living in the light of your goodness you have given us freedom freedom you have given us freedom you have given us freedom my chains are gone Freedom, you have given us freedom. You have given us freedom. Hallelujah. Freedom, you have given us freedom. You have given us freedom. My chains are gone. Freedom, you have given us freedom. You have given us freedom. Hallelujah! Now I have resurrection power, living on the inside, Jesus. You have given us freedom, no longer bound by sin and darkness, living in the light of your goodness. You have given us freedom. Resurrection power, living on the inside, Jesus. You have given us freedom, no longer down by sin and darkness. Living in the light of your goodness, you have given us freedom. Let's give him praise in the house this morning. Freedom through the blood of our Lord Jesus. Hallelujah to his name. Hallelujah to his name. The wonders of our God praise his name. Hallelujah. You know, one of these days, all praise, honor, and glory is going to be given to him. And there will be a sound that has never been heard. And if you are a lover of the Lord... If you have him as Lord on your heart, your Savior, your voice will be one of those voices raised in total praise and adoration of the one and only who is worthy, Jesus, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Let's stand this morning, if you're not already standing, and greet those around you. Get some coffee, a little bit of water. Pastor Bill has a wonderful word for us this morning.
I had to run and make us more coffee real quick. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. If it's good, I made it. That's right. You know, when uh, I think when it comes to stories, we can really, really appreciate Hollywood type endings. I mean, I do. I, I, I love the ending of The Princess Bride. I don't want to spoil it for anybody, but, uh, you know, just the fact that the, the heroes win, the bad guys defeated, they find true love, like all that. I think it's, I think it's great. But then there are some movies where the story is such that too jovial an ending just feels wrong. I remember another great movie, uh, Terminator 2. I'm necessarily But it stands out in my mind because apparently when it was uh, shown, they had the, you know these screenings, and the audience hated the ending. They hated the ending because they thought it was too upbeat, so they actually went back and changed the ending to make it a little darker, a little more unknown. <clears throat> the bad guy was still defeated. The apocalypse looks like it was averted, at least for a while, but who knows what's going to happen in the future. That seemed to fit the story a lot better. And this week, as we continue our series in People First, God's Desperate Desire to Be With Us, Jesus is telling stories, and this story is probably more like Terminator 2 than it is Princess Bride. Let me get that. Let, let's catch up. So, remember, what had happened is right at the beginning, Jesus was caught eating with sinners and tax collectors. And he was accused, rightfully so, by the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, the scribes that say, hey, you're eating with those people. And instead of responding like some of us might, you know, maybe defensively, like, you know, who are you to tell me? Or, well, yeah, I am, what are you going to do about it? He immediately gets right to the heart of the issue and tells three stories. The first story he tells is a shepherd that has lost a sheep and is willing to do whatever it takes to go find that one sheep to bring it back. And when he does, he celebrates. He tells a second story of, of a woman who lost a tenth of her savings, and she swept her house up and down until she found it. And when she found it, how excited she was, and she celebrated. And then he a third story that we talked about last week, which is gets way more in-depth into those ideas uh, of how much we can celebrate for, for that which was lost but is now found. And it is the story of a father who lost a son. A son who had decided to treat his family like it's over, he wanted his inheritance, and he'd go live. You know the story. It's the prodigal son. And the interesting thing is, is when I talk to a lot of people about the story of the prodigal son, they'll hear that phrase prodigal, and because they know the story, they assume the word prodigal means the son who returns. It actually, for what it's worth, it actually means the one who goes and does the wild living. But... But we know the story. We know the son returns in the joy of the father and as he celebrates. And so over and over, Jesus is telling a story to help these Pharisees, to help these scribes understand the heart of God. A God who is the shepherd who wants every single one of those sheep. The, the, the God who is a woman who wants every bit of her savings. The God who is a father that is so excited about the return of his son. But as we finish with the rest of the story, nobody remembers that phrase. And now the rest of the story. Come on, anybody? Okay, four of you. All right. But in any case, that the idea is we hear the rest of the story. We now move from seeing the heart of God. And Jesus seems to be shining a light on the heart of the Pharisees. The heart of the scribes. The one who were upset that Jesus was spending his time with those kind of people, the ones who had separated the world into those that God adores and those that God really doesn't deal with. The ones that have accused him, rightfully so, of being with people, but accused him of being with the wrong kind of people. Because now we move to the part of the story about the boring son who doesn't want to party. Let's just read it. Here at the end of Luke 15, starting verse uh, 25. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. 
When he came near the house, he heard music and, and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. And the servant answered, your brother has come, he replied. And your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him ba back safe and sound. And the older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders, yet you have never given me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you're always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Now, I don't know about you, but... Over the years, hearing this story, I've had to hear it multiple times before all the parts of it sink in, and I suspect I will probably need to spend another number of years as more of these parts sink in. Is it okay if I admit that I felt like the older brother had a point? Yeah, that he has a point that it's like, well, well, wait, wait, wait. We've got the good son and the bad son, and the bad son took off, and yet here he's back, and you're partying and hanging out with them, and I'm angry about that. But what we hear is that, that as we describe the son, remember, Jesus is telling the story, and he's moving to tell about the hearts of the Pharisees, the hearts of the scribes, the hearts of these people who said, who have separated the world into good sons and bad sons who have separated it, and he begins to talk, and, he, and he's pointing out some things about the son, about the Pharisees, and dare I say maybe even those of us who feel like the, son, the older son has a point, that he's describing something about that heart. And these, what the son sees, and you, if you'd like to follow along in your sermon outline, it's there in your work folder, as we fill in these blanks. But the, the first thing that the son sees and that is important to recognize is that I am a good slave. Right? He starts off saying, I have served you. I have always served you. I've always done what you need me to do. My responsibility, he shows, as he's talking to the dad, he goes, I have lived up to my responsibility, which is always to be the good, the good one that, that does all the right stuff. He sees his responsibility before the father as primarily the person who does good things. I, mean, I guess that's how the Pharisees saw themselves. They had rules upon rules to understand how to make sure they did the good things. You know, it, it wasn't enough to say, well, the Sabbath is made for us to contemplate God and to rest and to, to think big thoughts and to worship Him. And it was made not only to worship God, but it was made for us. And yet they said, well, but we got to go farther. We got to figure out, like it says, it's not, we're not supposed to work, but how much is work? And they had it down. They had how many steps you were allowed to walk that day. The distances you were, the, I, I have even heard tell, I haven't been able to verify this myself, but you even couldn't spit in certain ways because if it hit the dirt just right, that might be like playing. They wanted to make sure they were good. That they did everything they were supposed to do. They didn't want to take a chance of, of getting up to that line of anything. And so he saw his responsibility, God. Well, I guess I, I'm moving ahead in the story. But he's saying, Dad, I, 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 I am a good son. You know how I know I'm a good son? Because I am a good servant. I am a good slave to you. He sees his role primarily as one that just has to follow the rules. And conversely, that affects how he sees the father because he sees the father as you are the giver of orders. I have never failed, he said in verse 29. I have never failed to disobey your orders. See, he sees the father as primarily one who gives orders and he is the good because he primarily follows those orders. That is his relationship with the father. Hopefully we're seeing the point. 
Jesus is accusing the Pharisees of seeing their relationship with God as primarily one that's transactional. Where God appreciates them if they do all the right things. And there, conversely, that's why he doesn't like tax gatherers and uh, tax gatherers and sinners because they don't they didn't do all the right things. Because it's all about can I chalk up enough right stuff to be the good son? Am I good at obeying all your orders? Because that's primarily who you are, God. You are the giver of law. So we got this whole thing wrong. Mark 10 points out that Jesus came not to be served, but to serve. That there is this part that Jesus is there, not that he has come and he has been a part, not to just be the issuer of law but to give us everything we've always needed. We also find out when it comes to the older son that he sees that he has no joy. You've never had a party for me. Well, no wonder you're kind of boring. But I think the point in this is not you know, because we see that's unfair. I, I've never had it. Did he ever ask? Did he ever think to go to the father and say, hey, let's have a party. Let's celebrate. I would like to celebrate. I would love to have joy in this relationship. I would love for our relationship to be more than me just being out in the fields, doing work, and feeling like I'm obeying. Like, I want to be with you, and I want a relationship with you. Can we just be no indication that was ever asked? And there is some to be some sense that maybe he didn't ask. I'll get to that more in a little bit. But I'm also captivated by verse 30, where he says, this son of yours. By the way, if you want to follow along, the, uh, Amy printed the actual scripture on the other side of your outline so you can see that. But that he very specifically said, your son. He didn't say, my brother. He didn't say, you know, my brother might say, but your son, the one you have a relationship with, the one you're connected to, not the one I'm connected to. Your son. I can hear the vitriol. I can hear it in the same way I always tell my wife, you know what your dog did? Your dog. I want to be very clear. It's not my dog. It's your dog. Your dog is the one that was left out and decided to get into the uh, whatever we left out on the counter. Your dog. And the brother's doing that. It's, it's, it's your son. It's not my brother. Not my younger brother. I, that many ways what he is just saying is they, I say they, I guess I put it in the plural. In this case, it's he, he is yours. He's not mine. But ultimately, what the Pharisees, what the scribes, what the teachers of the law are saying when they accuse Jesus of hanging out with the wrong people, he's like, those are your people. They're not mine. That they don't see the connection that here I have brothers and sisters who were lost and now they're found instead it's those people those people of yours that i don't really have a connection to i'm separated from i'm i'm sacred that's literally what the term sacred means sacred means to be set apart for a purpose same word for holy it's set apart it's different than all the rest. And they're making something sacred about the differentiation between them and us, between me and you, between the older brother and the younger brother. I have sacredified, sanctified myself because I'm better. And, and the heart of God, that doesn't match the heart of God. It's not what God would consider sacred. That these people, these, those people, Tax gatherers and sinners are sacred too. They are part of this family. It's just not what the Pharisees and the scribes saw. It's not what the older brother saw. He saw his relationship with God it's primarily about following rules. You issue the rules, I'll do what I'm told. That's what this is about. And, and I'm good at it. And this person's not good at it. And... So he shouldn't really be back here, that he shouldn't be one of us, he shouldn't be in the house, shouldn't be with the family again, should be over there. So is it any wonder that he has no joy? 
that he isn't celebrating? Now, here's the real trick, right? We read the story. We see the story. You may have read through the New Testament and you hear that phrase, the Pharisees, and you see it over and over. And, and typically in their encounters with Jesus, the Pharisees seem to often be at odds with what Jesus wants, what God is trying to do. So we often have a view as Christians who have read the New Testament to begin to think of Pharisees as bad people. And, and we are able to sit in our corners and say, God, thank you, I'm not like those crazy Pharisees. But that doesn't seem to be how the father in the story handles that. Notice what he does. He's, he's not even taking that separate. He's not saying, yeah, there is a separation between good and bad, and by the way, you're the bad ones. Instead, here's how the father sees the situation first. He sees of his older son that he's worth coming to. You may recall there in verse 28, it points out that the father went out to him. He wasn't waiting for that son to finally turn around to come. He went out to the father. The father went out to the son. He went out of the party. He went out of the celebration. He goes to him and he says, you're worth coming to. Despite the fact that you're on the wrong side of this issue, despite the fact that you are wrong about this, despite like... I'm coming out to you. And he pleads with him. He says to his old son, you're worth pleading for. Same verse in verse 28. He pleads with him. He doesn't command him, get in there and party now. I remember my mom doing that to me once. It wasn't just like that, but she, she was just making me being inside. Go outside and have fun. And I showed her, I went outside and I was miserable. Yeah, that'll show her. Sat out there miserable the whole time. Or at least for seven minutes or however long I could handle that. Just to prove she can't tell me what to do. Told you I connect with the older son. But he goes, he he doesn't do that. Instead, he pleads with him. He tries again to convince. He goes, no, you need to hear my heart. You need to see who I am. You're missing this. You you don't seem to understand what's going on, and I want you to understand. Please come in. I'm going to come. I'm going to search for you. I'm going to invite you in to this kingdom, this, this home, this celebration, this party that we're having. I want you to be a part of that. Please come be a part of it. He says to his older son, we belong together. Two phrases. He says there in verse 31, he says, first of all, he calls him son. He calls him son, still says, yes, you are my son. Yes, you are my son. And we have all, you've always been with me. Was that a little bit of a dig? Was it a little bit of saying you thought our relationship was about me making rules and you following those rules when really it was about being with me? Like that's what this has always been about and I love not, you know, sure, I love that you are obedient. That's, that's good stuff and is obedient and chances are wasn't as obedient as he thought because what he seemed to miss is that the father just wanted to be with his sons. He wanted to be with his son. And then, of course, he says in verse 31 that he has everything. Everything I have belongs to you. Everything. Now, I don't know how much to go into the whole inheritance and, and you know, the younger son took his, so does that mean everything left is going to be his? Or is it really just a sense of him saying just everything, like you're not having to worry about stuff. This isn't like everything I have, this... This, this, this life, the home, the, the kingdom we have here, it's yours too. I invited you in. You're my son and you're part of this. This is yours. And see, this, is the, this last one is key. Remember, the son was upset. Remember how he complained, you never had a party for me. There was a party going on right then. That 
very moment there was a party. Come on, come in. No, he refused to go in. No, I'm not going in because I don't like why you're having the party. He says, here's a party. We're going to party together. We're going to celebrate together. We'll be with friends. We're going to be here together. Let's do this. He couldn't see that his father's party was his party. That his father's joy was his joy to be able to have. That, that what God longed for, I know I keep switching, but I'm hoping you're staying up with a metaphor, but what God wants for us That what God longs for, it's not like he's sitting there going, okay, I've got to organize this world, and do I do such things such a way that that Nancy's going to be really happy, but Kathy's going to be miserable? Like, I'll do it that way and figure out which one I love more. I'll let you guys fight it out to see which one, by the way. But, uh, But that's not how God operates. That he says he invites, he invites us all to the party that, that he has designed the world in such a way that what he is asking of us, what he wants of us, what he's training us to be, will bring more joy, will be more of the celebration that we were always going to have. We will find the greatest joy if we can begin to celebrate the things that God celebrates. So let's bring that around to us. I fear that far too many of us see the church, see a relationship with God as our goal is to be the older son. That life, the life of faith is primarily about sin management and making sure I get all the right things done and I'm, I'm one of the good ones, not one of the bad ones. And that is added to fuel when people rightly point out, hey, I thought you were a Christian, yet I see you're doing this. And we think, well, yeah, I need to, I need to get better. I need to get better at hiding the things that are wrong about me. I need to get, get that out and, and, and only show people all the good stuff. Let people think I'm a good guy so that they will think God is a good God because I'm, I'm always obeying The biggest problem with that is it can't be true. It wasn't true for the older son, despite his protests, that I have always obeyed. He clearly didn't. Because what the father wanted was a relationship with his son. Your God wants you to join him in the house and have a party. Hang out with the lost, to be those who need him, and to celebrate when they take steps of faith. You see, one of the problems often within churches is that people will think about, okay, I see the gap between where I am and where I should be. Like, I see the rules, and I see all this stuff, and I realize I'm not measuring up. And so... I want to do like all the things I hear about really good folks doing about, you know, spreading the kingdom of God out to, to share the gospel with other people, to, to see the kingdom expand, do all that stuff. But I'm not there yet, you see, because I have to take all these steps. I have to, I have to get this track record better of being, you know, the, 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 the good older son. And then when I do that, when I've done that long enough, and, and I don't even know how, if we have an idea in our heads, but I believe it after talking to people over and over that they believe that, that I need, that my goal is to be a really good older son. Now, I want to tell you, when looking at the story, I'm not telling you to switch and desire to be the younger son. I'm not saying that should be our goal either. Well, let's just tell the father. Because what happened is they were both struggling with the same thing. The younger son wanted the father dead. He didn't want the father for the relationship. He wanted him for what he could get out of him. Give me what I owe because I want to go live my own life and I want nothing to do with you. And the older son was doing exactly the same thing. He was just doing it. He was hanging out in the field and saying, you know, I'm, uh, I'm not interested in your stuff. I'm just interested in doing all the things I'm supposed to do so I can get your stuff later and be rewarded. When what the father wanted from both of them was just to have a relationship with his boys. So I want to tell you, no matter where you are in your faith journey, 
whether you just for the first time decided to say, I want a relationship with God today, or whether you've said it decades and decades ago. Now is the time for you to invest in the things that God wants to celebrate. There is a world out there that doesn't know Jesus. That you can see that, that we often can separate, well, those are the good guys and these are the bad guys, but instead that God says, no, everywhere you look, every pair of eyes you meet, every time you interact with somebody, you are interacting with somebody I thought was worth dying for. And I really, 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 really want to hang out with them. And I really, 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 really want you to be part of that so we can celebrate together. I've encouraged you over and over these past few weeks, and as we finish the series today, to say that I, I, I hope that you are taking some steps to be able to really experience the celebration that God would have by picking some people you know that don't know Jesus and begin to invest in them and invite them. Invest in them by finding ways to serve, to give, to, to, to go to them, to plead with them, to invite them to the party, to, to whatever. Maybe, maybe it's a neighbor that, that needs help moving or, uh, God forbid, yard work. Or maybe it's just you know, a way that you serve and help, and, uh, you know, I was, I was really impressed a few weeks ago, well, a few weeks, it's been months now, remember the whole windstorm, it seems like a whole world ago, and a whole bunch of tree limbs died all over this place during, and we, and I was just really pleased, I had a neighbor whose tree just, like, multiple and broken, and, and, and he's out there, and he is not, he's not a very svelte man, and he was going to go up on this ladder and chop off these limbs. And I'm like, I, I, I got to go help him because, you know, I'm a pastor and I got to do good things so I can preach about this one day. And but the thing that was cool before I even got out there, as I was getting my shoes, got out there. I'd already seen another neighbor had, was already there, already up on the ladder helping this man. To begin to find ways to invest into people, to serve, to care for them, and then invite them, invite them to the party, invite them to church, invite them to consider uh, what it might mean to have a relationship with God. And if you think, well, you know what, I, I, I can't be doing that, then what are we doing? What's the point? Just back to being older sons? Is that all we're just really interested in? Well, I'm going to obey, but I refuse to party? Instead, I think God is saying, let's party. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, God, you know, I live in a crazy, mixed-up neighborhood. I've got some people that are broken and messed up, and some of them not very good neighbors. Others that are great neighbors. And it's hard to have conversation. We don't have very big front yards. We all seem to have big backyards, and nobody really interacts with each other much. And, and it's so hard. Like, it, it'll take everything to just go out and meet him, to talk, to, to even find out what's going on in their lives, much less to be able to help. But Lord, I want to make a commitment that this week I'm going to open my eyes and I'm going to look for opportunities, whether it's my neighbors or my coworkers, whether it's my friends or people I, I, I go to school with, people I, I just hang around with, or whatever. Lord, help me to look and see opportunities to serve and invest in people. To find what it is that they need and, and, and that I can meet and do that. For no other reason than just to care about them because you care about them. And Lord, that part of my caring, part of that is as I see opportunity to invite, whether it's to invite them to church, to invite them to a Bible study, to invite them to just pray, I don't, whatever, that 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 I take seriously the idea of celebrating with you. Because, Lord, I believe it, that when I gave my life to you, that there was a party in heaven. And so I just asked to be able to be part of those parties for everybody else. In Jesus' name, amen.
Well, let's have a few minutes of open worship. Uh, if God puts something on your heart, uh, you can certainly stand and share that. And as I've said a number of times, I want to warn you, if you do get up and speak, our goal is not to listen to you. Our goal is to listen to what you're saying, to see if there are any words from our Lord that we need to take into consideration. And if we don't hear anything, then we'll just pray for you. <laughs> but meanwhile, we'll be praying. We'll be focusing on Christ. And so feel free to get up and share uh, if God has put something on your heart that meant for all of us. And uh, I'll close this in a couple minutes.